Hi there. Um, I'm Julie Fleck. I am a creator, showrunner, and I'm here to bring this support group to order. Uh, because honestly, isn't really that what we all need? <laughs> like, <laughs> we really do. Like just a, a, a weekly meeting where we can sit with people who do what we do or what, you know, or aspire to do what we do and hear about each other's experiences. Because like, honestly, nothing about this job is easy. Sometimes it's a downright hellscape. Um, so, you know, we're all each other's got and, uh, and I'm actually like, super excited to be here today. Um, and thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation for hosting our live group therapy. Um, and I'm available to host when we start the podcast. So uh, I'll just put that in everybody's ear. Uh, today is really exciting because we are here to celebrate the massive success of Yellow Jackets created by excuse me, Ashley Lyle and Bart Nickerson for Showtime, um, and then show run by them and Jonathan Lisco, who is here with us today. So a big mm -hmm. welcome to them and to all of you who have joined us today. And this is super weird because I'm really just staring at a screen of three faces and I have absolutely no idea if there's like one person listening or, um, or you know, like several hundred, but, um, oh, 183. Okay, oh, 85. Great, we're growing. Let's, let's, let's keep growing. Um, <laughs> anyway, so today is about you all and your show. So before we dive into the show, I just kind of want to start with the basics, like get you three warmed up just a bit. Um, and because everybody loves like a good origin story, can you just kind of tell us, I think each of you, like the beginning of your career, like the, that little moment between like, I moved to LA to be a writer and oh my God, I've got a job and I'm a writer. Just give us a little little highlight of, of that experience for each of you. Well, I guess the, the fun part for myself and Bart is um, it mostly involves a, a very cool showrunner named Julie Fleck. That's <laughs> <laughs> our first job as <laughs> staff writers on the originals. Um, before that, Bart and I, you know, we've been writing together. We, we actually thought we were gonna be comedy writers. And we moved to LA from um, the East Coast with like a suitcase full of spec scripts, which is completely dating ourselves as well. But, you know, <laughs> we had like a scrub spec and a 30 rock spec and we had all our comedy specs. And then um, we wrote a pilot, not, not knowing really that um, that would, you know, that you had to choose at that time between comedy and drama. And we had an idea for a pilot, which I think you read. Um, it was called the, the Devil You Know. It was sort of Faust set in high school. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. And um, and then that ended up being the script that got us started getting us read a little bit. And um, I think we got one, we had like a weird feature job that would be that we got off of that pilot actually, but then we really wanted to work in TV and we, you know, spent a couple of years trying for staffing and and at a certain point, I think you and Narduch read us and we got a meeting and we ended up getting the job. Yeah, I uh, remember because I didn't meet you guys for like Vampire Diaries, I think yeah. originally. And then, and then like randomly ran into you at a party that I was co-hosting yeah. at Peter Freelander's house <laughs> in 2008. I think. And <laughs> yeah, um, yeah uh, that first uh, kind of meeting that we had for uh, Vampire Diaries, I actually uh, I'll reference that meeting a fair bit because I think that we, the meeting was like the day after a big death had aired. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. And like, we like, like, we're just like a uh, jokingly like, like, oh my God, I can't believe you killed Anna. And uh, you were like, yeah, but her story was done. And like, sometimes like you have to do the thing that the story demands, even if it's not going to be popular or fun, because like, that's the only way to keep the story like rich. And like, I probably bring that up like uh, once a month, just because like so uh, kind of often on uh, Yellow Jackets, like uh, uh, we kind of found ourselves like sort of like feeling that pull of like, well, this isn't going to feel good, but like it feels like it's right. Wow, that's awesome. A made me just sound very smart, but B, you're right. <laughs> that, is, that is a really good perspective because I, over the years, have turned into a big old softy and, like, <laughs> I can't bring myself to kill people sometimes. Like, there's characters on some of my shows that, like, their story was probably over, like, after season one, and I can't bring myself to get rid of them. So um, I take my own advice. Um, 
So yeah, all right. So the originals, and you guys did three years on the originals. Um, left me uh, devastatingly uh, for cooler streamer streaming patch pastures, and uh, went and did what Narcos for two years, right? And yeah, then, uh, uh, and yeah. Then yeah, um, and awesome. then we worked on a show called uh, Dispatches on uh, kind of AMC, which was super fun. That's, just, um, that's, that's yeah, great. Uh, Dispatches from elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you, uh, you... we spent twenty five years developing Yellow Jackets. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so you had a very young career that like exploded early, and then they aged you in real time um, in the development process. I guess is is really what. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, like, um, like, I guess it's funny because, yeah, like when you uh, stack it up from like the moment that we started to work, like, I guess it like it is like fast, but it it feels very slow. And I feel like it took us like a beat to get in like the first door um, just because like, yeah, like I can still remember like just being close on stuff and then like, you know, like uh, being close on something and then not getting it and then having to show up for your shift at like a restaurant is like a particular um, excruciating sensation um, where it's like you had already told your boss to like, you know, in kind of your brain, you're just like, oh man, I'm like, I'm not gonna show up to that last shift. I'm just gonna tell everybody what I think of them. And then it's like, well, back to your side work. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the, like the next level of that humiliation is something didn't happen to me, but I was at, um, this is by the way, a long time ago. So I'm gonna say probably, in the late 1999s. Um, but I had co-produced a little movie called The Broken Hearts Club that Greg Berlanti wrote and directed. And Zach Braff was in the movie. It was his first, I think, legit acting job. And he had gone to Northwestern and we had gone to Northwestern. And, uh, and then he hadn't really done much after Broken Hearts Club. And so Greg and I were at lunch at a restaurant one day after the movie had opened and come and gone. And Zach was our waiter. And we were like, oh, hey, <laughs> hey, buddy, <laughs> how you doing? And he's like, you know, if you'd asked me this yesterday, I'm sure the answer would have been different. But today is my last day at Le Colonial because I just booked a pilot and it was Scrubs. And so there you go. So anything can happen. Um, Jonathan Liska, tell us about your origins, please. Um, well, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. Ashley, you said you were dating yourself with uh, the scripts and everything. I mean. If you're dating yourself, I'll date myself. But I remember uh, I had been, I had been a lawyer, basically a Wall Street lawyer, and uh, talk about my soul being out of its socket. It was not working for me. Let's just put it that way. So I actually <laughs> took off that merry-go-round. And apropos of your story that you just told, Julie, I was waiting tables at 10th and 23rd in uh, New York City, and uh, trying to write a play. And long story short. Uh, I didn't even know, thank God I had a dumb spot in my brain at that point about how Hollywood worked. You know, being from the Midwest, it was sort of a black box to me because I was just writing a play, assuming that somehow that would change my life. And in truth, it actually did because uh, I wrote a play called The Decision and there was a little reading of it. And uh, long story short, it got into the hands of uh, Robert De Niro's production company. And uh, they asked me to come in and pitch a movie. And on November 2nd of 1999, I found out that they bought a pitch of mine uh, at, while I was riding in a cab in New York City, uh, it was raining and I was like, oh my God. And I wasn't even represented at the time. I was sort of hip pocketed by a guy named Larry Schumann, a wonderful manager in town who wound up becoming my manager for, for, for many years at the beginning of my career. And he said, John, are you sitting down? I said, yeah, I'm in a cab. It's raining. He's like, well, uh, you know, Tribeca just uh, made you an offer to buy this pitch. So I've been working ever since. And, uh, and I just wanted to tell one other story. After I quit the law firm and I had sort of announced to most of my colleagues, I was a mergers and acquisitions lawyer, that I was going to become a writer and they pretended to be supportive. I was waiting tables at a place called Zucca at 23rd and 10th when in the door came 10 investment bankers on an expense account and I was their waiter. So that was a bit of a test of character for me. And as I went behind the velvet scrim, I just thought, you know what, if I can get through this torture, uh, Hollywood will probably be... Uh, a drive through wine country. But did they tip you? 10 investment uh, bakers, that's a hearty tip. Right? Yeah, I mean, they tipped me. The bill was like, you know, $7,200 by the time it was over. And I think they tipped me. I can't actually remember. I think I was in some sort of fugue state at the time. Yeah. You'd remember a $1,600 tip. So um, they yeah, did not tip sure. you enough. 
But then long story short, <laughs> off that, I got a job on NYPD Blue. That was my, I, I had just gotten married. That was my first job. Uh, Stephen Bochco flew me to LA to, you know, ask me what I thought of the show. I had never seen it because there was no streaming at that time, but he hired me anyway. And uh, then I wound up working for a bunch of other people, including Greg. And, uh, and here I am. Well, welcome. Um, I want to talk a lot about the relationship between the three of you in a little bit, because it is a uniquely pleasant experience that you've had with each other. And, um, and I, that's so rare that I want, we've talked about wanting to get into that, but I kind of want to move a little bit in chronological order just to kind of set the stage a bit. So um, Asha Bart, a couple of things for you guys about the origins of all of this. So, you know, the old adage, there's no such thing as a new idea in, um, in Hollywood, yet here you have like a script that's not based on any IP. I mean, like we could all you know, point to Lord of the Flies, I suppose, but, um, but you just kind of, we're like, let's write this really fucked up story about women and cannibal. I mean, like what, how did, how did it, it was it a pitch? Was it a spec? Did you pitch it and then have to write it or did you write it and then sell it? It, it was a pitch. Uh, okay. We, it started with, you know, we're always throwing ideas back and forth and um, we, we were working on Narcos at the time and our reps were at UTA and um, our agency said, so we're like, it's time, you got to develop now. And, you know, we were kind of happily just bopping along, just writing Narcos. And we're like, okay, fine. And uh, I remember we wrote up, they were like, write up five ideas, like that old chestnut. And so we wrote up these five ideas and- um, Wait, what is that old chestnut actually? Because I think that's valuable advice. I feel like I've heard a bunch of people say that, that their, their agents will at some point say like, okay, give us five ideas and like, you know, write up a little paragraph about each one. And then they really did kind of zero in on this one, which apparently Yellow Jackets was like the most normal of all of our ideas, the cannibalism show. They were like, that one we can at least sell. These other ones are just too fucking weird, you guys. But um, yeah, so we had, we had two other ideas that we were really excited about, but were very much deemed, I think, a little too strange by our agents. And so we had written like a whole page on each of those. And then we wrote this little paragraph about Yellow Jackets. It was, you know, kind of the very basics girls you know, high school, so you know, sports team, I think, yeah, I think we said soccer team, um, you know, get a plane crash, and then we follow both the, you know, the survivalist story in the past and the women in the present, um, the survivors, and they immediately kind of went, that, that's the one you're pitching that. Wow. And then you had to actually flesh that out and pitch it, but um, was it sort of between the time you pitched the idea and shot the script does it still kind of resemble where you started or was it one of those um, yeah i mean like like i definitely feel like it does like 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 in terms of the way that it feels i mean like a lot of the particulars maybe um shifted from like that like original pitch to like producers but like i feel like a lot of like uh, the dna uh, of the show um sort of like was like a kind of retained I mean, we, we tend to hear that was thorough a lot, um, which I know has become sort of also a, a joke of like, you know. The, very well told. Thoroughly, yeah. Very well told. And, uh, and so we pitched, you know, I think we had like a 35 minute fully memorized word for word pitch. And, um, you know, a lot of it did stay. I think we, we pitched everything from, you know, Ali's leg being broken in the pilot to Jackie freezing to death at the end of the season um, in that original pitch. So a lot of it did stay, but a lot of the, you know, finding the exact tone and, and a lot of the present day stuff, you know, we had to flesh out because we didn't pitch all of it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, I mean, like, like, uh, 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 like uh, we do spend like, um, like, like an absurd amount of time, um, like on sort of like tonal uh, kind of exchanges, like uh, talking about like uh, movie references for like uh, different scenes or different storylines. And uh, we tend to make like uh, playlists before we start to write, which like I always go back and forth on because like as I'm doing it, it feels like such a like procrastination technique, uh, like and like I'm sure that it is, but then it also kind of pays off sometimes too. So I still don't know how to resolve that one. Like how much like pre work is like fine, and how much is actually just like a uh, wasting time. 
that yeah i could write a manifesto on my opinions about that i could too sure. i could too but maybe we should, <laughs> you know, I, I have thoughts about that but i i will just say to you bart i don't think it's wasted time i think there are decreasing marginal you know returns at some point mm -hmm. but I, I think you know you guys talked about the tonal exchanges and one of the reasons why the tone is so distinct is because you've you know gone 15 miles deep with it not just you know 15 miles wide and and the thinking that goes into that kind of thing while it's not literally on the page i believe is completely manifest in great material so i would keep doing it unless we're under <laughs> <a deadline. laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> um, and, and I, I know you've talked i'm sure ad nauseum in interviews and stuff about the casting and i don't want to spend all that much time on it um but you did in fact hit like the casting lightning bolt like you just fucking nailed it forgive my um swearing um and i so just give us i mean give us your give us the the two minute version of how that all came to be oh man i mean the the real quick version is just that it was so hard kind of a nightmare so many times we were just in this little tiny casting office it was you know we made the pilot pre-pandemic so we were actually in person and we really wanted to be in person for all the auditions, which about halfway through, we were like, why have we done this to ourselves? But, um, cause I just get very anxious for the people in the room. But um, I mean, we just saw hundreds of girls and we just slogged it out. There was a lot of, you know, holding our heads in our hands and just kind of going, this is never going to work. Like, what are we even doing? And then it was sort of right at the last minute when it had to, it just started to kind of come together. We did get very lucky slightly early in the process because Melanie, Melanie Linsky was sort of first in on the project and that was relatively early. And so that helped a lot in terms of sort of validating the project um, when we were going out to the other adult actresses. But um, finding all the, the young talent was just so hard, but I think it worked, you know, it, it paid off, but it, it, it was just, we did it the old fashioned way, just auditioning a billion people. And chicken yeah. and the egg, was it you were starting with the women and then trying to match them or you were everything was ongoing at once and you were just trying to find pairings as you went? It was uh, uh, largely ongoing. We generally tried to do um, uh, the adult character first, uh, like, like uh, um, in part because like a lot of people that we were going to, you know, are like a, a kind of a, 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 a kind of offer only and you know, you're sort of like uh, pitching them the story and like uh, 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 trying to sell them on it. So that felt like, you know, the place to start and then to try to pair the younger person uh, with them. But that was actually not, you know, uh, uh, kind of always possible. And so these things were very much like happening, like uh, kind, of, uh, kind of at the same time. Um, and like, I feel like it was our first um, like uh, introduction to something that like, I'm guessing uh, that we'll talk about later. It's just the like I guess is like the like uh, like the show running a uh, 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 kind of conundrum. It's like, do you have time to get like better than what you have? And it, and uh, you know because you can't spend all your time getting the perfect of any one thing because like that time is going to come from someplace. And so it's like, well, how good can we uh, make this without hurting everything else that has to come later in kind of the process? Um, and so, yeah. It was that very is, um, difficult, yeah. <laughs> I'm having like heart palpitations just thinking about it. The clock ticking. Yeah. Gotta get it done. Oh God. Um, <laughs> all right. So one last question about the about the pilot. Um, maybe it'll turn into one or two more questions down the road. But you make your pilot, you kill yourself, you get into the editing room, you've worked your ass off, you finally get to sort of watch the fruits of your labor for the first time. <laughs> was it terrible? How did you feel? I will say, and I feel like, I mean, we're, we're amongst writers, we're in a safe space, like, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, first cuts and director's cuts will like make you want to die a little bit, but that was not the case with this one. Karin shot it in such a particular way. And so because we had to be so efficient, like we were running and gunning, I think we had 96 setups or something insane. And so the whole thing was so run and gun that she really shot just the pilot. Like you could kind of see it coming together as we were shooting it. And I know that that made the network very nervous because they kept saying like, well, you need options, you need options. And we were like, we need more shoot days then. So I don't know what to tell you. 
and it it worked out and we did have to do a lot of work on the pilot but the first cut was really actually just exciting to see mm -hmm. that's good that's great and then jonathan so that leads us to you because then at a the certain point when it got picked up to series they did the dreaded oh young young writers you haven't done this before you need a partner speech which you know i could also write a manifesto and all of that um, but the uh, the arranged marriage, you know, was sort of forced, of course. And it's, you know, again, among friends, it's kind of every writer's worst nightmare. Um, and before the Zoom, I made a point of asking each of them if this has actually been a good marriage or a bad one, because if it's a bad one, like I wasn't going to ask this question. So rest assured, this is a good relationship. But um, thank God. Uh, but John, Jonathan, tell us what the job of like forced show writing partner <laughs> starts at and then and then how you guys evolved into what you ended up having with each other oh i think you're on mute I, th I thank you so much for the question but i have to reframe it because i would never do it if it were truly a forced show running partner situation and i've been i've been i know you were obviously not intending that literally but i've been approached you know a fair number of times about partnering up with creators uh generally i tend to run the stuff that i myself create um this is only the second time that I've actually paired with creators um, of a show that I did not create to decide to partner with them. And I have to tell you, um, it's dangerous. It so frequently goes off the rails that I tend to turn these jobs down. Why? Because somebody has to be in charge. And unless there are two things very much in operation, mutual trust and respect, then it falls apart so quickly. It falls apart like lightning. But when I met Ashley and Bart, and by the way, we kicked the tires on each other quite a lot. And Ash and Bart, you should comment about how you felt maybe initially when it was even brought up that you should have a partner, because I think a lot of people might be interested in your feelings about that if you're willing to talk about it. But I, for one, was um, very hesitant to go into a marriage with two people who had thought about this for three years prior to my existence. I wanted to make sure that A, of course I love the material, but B, I genuinely felt that there was a high probability that I could love the people involved. And when I met Ashley and Bart, immediately I saw that they were determined to convey two things, honesty and kindness. Those two things very rarely go together in our business. I think a lot of people think that if you, if you manifest the latter, it's a sign of weakness. And somehow this business is so cutthroat that you'll seem weak. That is not in fact the case. What you need in the crucible of a writer's room is trust, respect, kindness, and radical honesty. And after meeting, I don't know how many times guys, you know, we felt like we were kindred spirits in that sense and that we would have that kind of relationship because it's absolutely necessary, which is not to say that we agree all the time. We absolutely do not, but that is part of the fun and that is part of the reward, but it can only be that way when everything else that I just mentioned is intact. And when it's not there, it can go. It, when, it, when, it's, when it's not there, think about it. I mean, basically one of the problems with show running, right? Is that you get decision fatigue. Every single day you have 50 decisions to make, 35 of which are actually pretty important. And if you're gonna, we'll talk about catastrophization of those things in a second. But even just making those decisions, if you can't quickly get on the phone or on the Zoom and talk it out and reach consensus, you will, you're dead in the water. Basically, the show will go off the rails in a matter of weeks, in my experience. Yeah, and I mean, like, uh, one thing, like, I guess to be honest, I don't know that I necessarily sensed in our, like, early uh, kind of meetings, but uh, one thing that I can say now uh, uh, safely, like, I think, like, uh, one thing that, like, works for the three of us um, I mean, like, also just to go back, like, just to like how stunned I am that this all worked out is like, I mean, <laughs> I felt so betrayed and angry when I heard that we were going to get paired with uh, another showrunner because, you know, I mean, like, like, you know, uh, there was also just like, like a part of us uh, that was like, like, you know, yes, uh, we were not the most experienced, but we had made it to co uh, kind of VP level, like had worked on shows. Like, uh, you know, uh, 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 we were very surprised um, that we were going down this road. And then having heard horror stories, having known some people uh, personally very closely that ran into trouble, like, we're just like, this is going to be like a, a, a kind of a nightmare. And I feel like within 
two or three weeks of uh, kind of working together, we were just like, Jonathan can never leave. Like, uh, like, like, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can only do this together from now on. Like, it is just, just um, but like, I think part of why we get along and correct me if I'm wrong, Ash and Jonathan is like, I do think we all like, like we very like deeply and profoundly believe in the sort of like transformative process of not only creation, but also creation in uh, collaboration. And so that like, it's not about getting your own way. It's not even about getting the right thing because I like, I don't even know like what the right thing is. It's just about like getting the thing that like you're supposed to get if that's not too uh, woohoo-y. Like, but like, like, it's just like, like just like being on like the journey together, like kind of, um, although I don't know if you guys would like say it that way. I feel like you like uh, kind of agree, but correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no. You'll see us uh, a break up right here. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I, like Bart said, you know, we were, it, it was very late in the process. You know, we had made the pilot already and we had sort of written a backup script and it was like right before or like right after we knew we were getting the series order that they were like, oh, one hitch. And so, you know, as Bart said, we had been sort of number twos in a room. We've produced a lot of television. You know, we've, we've been on set and done the whole thing. We made the pilot. So we were like, what the hell? And now in and our executive, Amy, is real at Showtime. And this, you know, and, and she was clearly, it was actually a really nice conversation because she she came into it kind of really understanding that we were not going to be happy about this and like had a very honest approach where she was just like, I've seen it too many times. I've, I've seen first time showrunners on really big shows just absolutely crash and burn. And I know you're not gonna like understand it now, but trust me, like this is for the best. And so, you know, now I, I really wish I could go back to that, you know, the month, at, you know, between us having that conversation with her and us partnering with Jonathan that was just so filled with angst and just get that fucking time back because it really was worrying for nothing. I mean, not worrying for nothing. Had we not gotten so lucky in the pairing, I think it could have gone really wrong. But I think Part of it is that, you know, I, I once saw a show running described as um, being beaten to death by your own dreams, and uh, it does feel apt. It is so much harder than I think we anticipated. <laughs> and I think having a partner who you really, really trust and respect, um, both creatively and as a person, and who can be a friend and in that foxhole with you, just makes it, makes something that feels almost impossible feel almost possible if that makes sense it was what is, somebody said I can't I don't remember who to credit to but show running is a pie eating contest where the prize for winning is more pie it's it's yeah. funny because I I had put a line like that in a play I wrote in 1999 and then I think it was Genji Cohn who actually used it in a Vanity Fair article recently where she was profiled and I should probably call her up and say hey you know I think that was <laughs> Genji yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll share credit with her. I'll share credit with her. But no, but it's absolutely true. You know, it's like a pie eating contest. And when you win, sure, you have more. There's very few short term rewards in doing it well, other than to continue to do it. I think David Mamet once said it was like running a marathon until you die. Yeah. Yep. But it's not all it's not all gloom and doom. I mean, there's a lot of rewards in it, too, especially if you're in the right partnership. So you know, we can, we can pivot to that anytime. Julie. Oh, you're right. Yeah. My dog is barking. So I'm just trying to stay on mute for 30 seconds until she hushes. I still love that you're a dog person now, but um, yeah, I mean, what Bert said is true. Well, you know, I, I know that the odds aren't great that Jonathan just wants to spend the rest of his career and uh, life working with us, but we, don't be so sure about that. Don't be so sure about that. It's such a good experience. Like, who wants to do it alone, honestly? I mean, that's an interesting comment that you made because, like, at the beginning of my career, again, we all sort of like come into this with some level of ego, or else why would you even try to do it? You know, why would you have the arrogance to try and create something from nothing? However, you know, whereas at the beginning of my career, I'm like, no, I'm going to be the boss. Now, the more great people I can surround myself with, the better. And honestly, that like, 
kudos to you and a tribute to you, Jonathan, and also to, to you guys, Ashley and Bart, because like the job cannot be done by one person, period, end of story. It cannot be done by 50 people. It is a job where you actually never finish the job. Like that is the sad truth about, about show running. And so like the idea that someone would come in and, and, and sort of feel like they, you know, like they can't use the help or that they alone have the only say, you know, because they have, you know, Jonathan, in your case, it could have been, well, I have all the wisdom and experience, therefore I need to be the one in charge. Like for the love of God, it's like, a, it's a free for all. So as long as you can be the leader of the free for all, and, and work well with others. Like this is the greatest thing that the greatest gift that could have happened to the three of you is being able to have three bodies to help share the load. And I don't think you probably still got it all done um, because it's just that it's just that much work. So yeah. but it's, a, it's a testament to you when you said talking about leading with honesty and kindness. Um, you know, not everybody approaches the world or the job like that, especially in Hollywood. People think they have to flex People think they have to, you know, they have to be the boss, they, you know, whatever, they have to like be the schmoozer. And um, so may, may I say, may I say one more thing about that, Julie? Sure. I really think it, it is, of course, a great way to be in the world if you can try. And of course, we all have our deficiencies, but if you can strive for that, of course, that's a great way to try and be in the world. But I think it has um, advantages for productivity too, because let's face it, as showrunners, we're always dealing with imperfect data. We're tumbling forward, making these decisions based on uh, sometimes awfully uncertain and incomplete data. So 80-20 rule, they use it in business, let's use it in show running. Like if you empower the people who work for you and you expect of yourself to essentially make good decisions 80% of the time with very imperfect data, with a million plates spinning at the same time, that's a pretty good level of success. And when you make a wrong decision, if you're honest about it, obviously you can still be the bosses and be honest about the fact that this didn't go the way you wanted to do. When the people who work with and for you see that, they feel great about it because it empowers them to use their judgment to make decisions, therefore taking stuff off of your plate. You're empowering them to now go do their jobs, knowing that if they make a mistake here and there, you're not going to fire them. And that, yeah. that level of like shared vulnerability in the process of a creative challenge actually, I believe, gets the best work out of people you work with. Yeah, if, if you make a mistake, we'll fix it. That's, if that can be your mantra, you know, if, if, if it's, it, 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 and everything's subjective. So what we might call a mistake isn't necessarily even a mistake at all. It's just your point of view that is in conflict with ours. So um, yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good leadership strategy. And it really, um, I, I admire it. So good, good on you. Uh, yeah, well, and, and like uh, just to say, uh, uh, I, 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 I kind of one more thing. Sorry, but like, like, but like, it, like, it's also weird because, like, you know, like just being at the beginning of maybe like the leadership journey. It, like, it's so hard because it's like to get into your first a uh, leadership position in television. You are in charge of like zero people ever, and then you're like <laughs> in charge of everyone, right. and it's like. You know, and like, because like, uh, you know, like uh, one of the things that's really hard about a lot of what you're saying, Jonathan, is like, you know, developing the confidence in yourself, because it's like, you know, it's like, I think we all, especially as like uh, uh, kind of writers, you know, are like very sensitive people. And I feel like prone to feeling like uh, the underdog all the time. And then all of a sudden uh, you're in charge and it's like, you don't exactly know what you're doing because there's no way I think uh, uh, you guys correct me if you feel differently uh, with your experience but it's like you have to find your own way to do it like you have to find your own like a leadership voice and style and there are a lot of people that aren't telling you that like you're doing it wrong it's just that like you project onto them uh, the expectations of you that you think they have and so it's like it's a real tricky thing to like uh, navigate like you know um, uh, um at least for me and like still trying to figure it out i guess like clearly but um yeah it's a like it's really hard and it's really strange it's absolutely true i mean the first show i ran you know you go from being a writer and sometimes you decide to shower before you start the day and then <laughs> suddenly you're a showrunner and now you're like the ceo of a metaphorical airline and you've got to build the planes you know as they're taking off it's a very strange transition for a lot of yeah. people 
Um, and, and by the way, there's no one real way to do it. No. There's no one. Like, I remember I was speaking at the Writers Guild showrunner training program, and I walked into a room, and somebody was like, so I know we're not supposed to rewrite our other writers' scripts when we're showrunning, but um, how? what do we do if the script's really bad? And I was like, well, who the fuck told you not to rewrite another writer's script? And he goes, John Wells. And I was like, oh, shit. Okay. So John Wells does not believe in rewriting material. He believes in, you know, walking through the process so that it, uh, I mean, you would know better than well, I would, Jonathan. I, so, I, <laughs> having, having worked very closely, and, and John is a very good friend of mine, and I've worked closely with him for years uh, prior to this on two shows, you know, five or six years we worked together very closely. He does believe in everything you just said, Julie, but he still rewrites the scripts when necessary. Uh -huh. and, I, and I would look him in the eye and say that, like, <laughs> what he's done is he's created a, a cycle. And it's very much, honestly, the way Ash Bart and I run the room too. It's like a 10 week, 11 week cycle so that we can give each writer, treat each writer like a writer and get each writer to the place where best case scenario, we've got a two or three day polish ahead of us when this script comes in. If you can deliver a draft like that, where, you know, because of course, Ash and Bart are the creators and they've got a very specific voice, they have the prerogative to do their pass as they should. If that can take a couple of days as opposed to a couple of weeks, that's a massively successful cycle. Yeah. And I think that that's yeah. what I hope John was meaning. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but like he will definitely rewrite and suggest the script changes when necessary. Okay, good. Because I thought that was bananas. <laughs> As you're, oh, no, you're not. I'm but yeah, because I mean, every, I mean, I feel like that's, that's the adjustment that you make when you first become a staff writer, you know, I've been talking about the adjustments that you make when you become a showrunner, but, you know, you, you can't be precious, you will be rewritten, it's not necessarily indicative of the fact that you did like a terrible job, but sometimes, you know, the showrunner has ideas, you know, sometimes I'll read, Bart and I will, and Jonathan will read a script and it's not that, you know, it's just like now we have a cool idea for, you know, a thing we want to put in it. And, you know, I, I feel like as the showrunner, it's your prerogative to do that. We we also, you know, as as Jonathan was saying, we we like to give writers a lot of, you know, opportunities to to take notes and to keep working. So we do that. And also the one thing I do think is like really bad form, and I know some people do it, but we would no matter no matter how much or how little rewriting we're doing, I don't think a showrunner should ever take the writer's name off the script unless it's like a situation of some sort. But I know that sometimes there are showrunners who will be like, well, I wrote on it. It's like, well, yeah, you get credit for every episode. It's your show. Like you don't need yeah. to take residuals out of somebody's pocket, but that's just our attitude. There are some horror stories. That is for damn sure. Um, Quick little aside, because I want to talk actually quite a lot about structure, the structure of your season, the narrative structure, um, and what that was like in the writer's room. So start thinking about that, because we're getting there. Um, but I remember you guys telling me when, um, probably during our code name Zoom COVID party, um, that you had been asked, before the series pickup, you had been asked to write a second episode of the show that wasn't actually the second episode, that had to be like, maybe like episode seven or like maybe never an episode, but like just an example of how the show would sound to them. Like now that you've, now that we've seen the whole season, one, did that episode become an episode? Two, how the hell do you even do that? And that I know caused you a lot of consternation. So just to tell that story real quick. I mean, I think specifically what they said was, you know, we don't want episode two because we all know what episode two is going to be. It's the aftermath of the crash. And we're like, okay. So then what they said was what something that feels like episode two and episode nine had a baby, which we were like, what does that mean? <laughs> but, you know, what we took it as is, um, you know, just trying to show what, you know, trying to really build some stakes and, and up the ante and what we did was, you know, I think a lot of the adult storyline ended up getting thrown out because we didn't, we hadn't broken the whole season. Yet. So we were, it was just sort of like an example of like what type of stuff it could be. But the wilderness story ended up being basically, a lot of it was used in episodes three and four. I was going to guess it was the, the homecoming dance okay. because that felt like an episodic idea that you could have like come up with out of like out of out of nothing with no context but okay three and four all right that i'm sorry that you had to get put through that that sounds yeah. absolutely terrible 
Yeah, I mean, it was definitely very tricky to do. I, I, I mean, like, uh, not to be like overly uh, diplomatic, but like, you know, like, like, you know, like it made like uh, um, it made sense from their side to like ask for it because like they wanted something to be like a sales tool internally because like our pilot was very much a sort of like prologue pilot, you know, like it, it you know, uh, they don't get to uh, the wilderness where obviously a huge portion of kind of the story uh, uh, of the season takes place. So they wanted like something that could sort of like close that gap, but also didn't want it to be boring. So like, like, but it was really hard. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) My nightmare. Well, actually that's a good segue back into the question I wanted to ask because your pilot, um, you, you know, you tell the audience at the jump, basically this is a show about people who are stranded in a wilderness long enough to become sort of feral and perhaps cannibals. Um, and, and one of them, you know, one of them dies and it, it, you just started. That's the first like 90 seconds of your show, right? So talk about that and the season because you're running, you have the audacity as storytellers to juggle three and sometimes four different time periods when you yeah, go back in the childhood past as well. How, well, I guess, let me start with this, Jonathan, as as the, the, the person in this room that probably has spent the most time in rooms, right? How do you run a room to do that? Um, there are so many answers to that question. Um, this may surprise everybody on this Zoom, but I believe one way to do it is not to spend 12 hours in the room every single day. Because a lot of people get in there, they say, okay, we're under the gun. John, funny, John Wells once said to me, just always assume you're behind the day they pick up the show. And that is a good mind frame to have. But one thing you should not do is force everybody into a room 12 to 14 hours a day. Because I guarantee at about six o'clock after the Indian food comes and cools and everybody's eating it, no work is getting done. Okay, and so what you should do is you should set the standard at the beginning that people will we'll meet for reasonable hours, but when you're not there, be percolating, be bringing in pitches, be thinking about how the storylines talk to one another. Even if it's half-baked, quarter-baked, give me a transition, give me a moment or a beat that fits together. And then we used to do it physically, but now because we're all in Zoom, we do it on this endless Moreau board, which is essentially an endless whiteboard, as I'm sure many of you have worked with. And we've got color-coded, crazy, murder board-like cards up everywhere. So, you know, it's the usual thing where you've got the characters down the side, the teen ones, the adult ones, the episodes across um, on the x-axis, and then like everything you can think of jumbled together. And as you build it out, and if you can't fit it all there, you start a mini board. You start another mini board about a particular storyline or a particular emotional moment. And you try and thread those threads together to then bring that piece of rope into the main board. And that's the way you do it. In a way, there's sort of no recipe for it other than patience, diligence, and focus. That's like a beautiful mind. <laughs> it, does, it does feel that way, right? I mean, I, I wish we could show you guys um, our boards right now. I mean, they are definitely crazy making. Well, and um, if I could just add like two things about like the process that you kind of brought to uh, Yellow Jackets that like I think are really cool are one is like a lot of the like especially the early room talk like will sort of like go in these directions that just get like dropped later like not dropped but just like uh, what was the thing that like you said once about like like creating this granite to be like carved away uh, kind of later so it's like like uh, we'll play things, you know, six, eight, 12 beats, you know, down. And then it just becomes the story that you can pull from um, that like uh, might turn to something different. It might go away. It might go um, exactly how we talked about it. And I think a big part of that is the second thing that I wanted to bring up is, you know, which like, I guess it sounds like, uh, like, uh, 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 like uh, this is something that at least like started or is like a version of uh, the John Wells thing because of like a sort of like long script cycle. It's like, like, like a lot of room is allowed for the writer to take like ownership of the story. Like, and so it's like, 
you know, they'll be given like a lot, like a lot of ingredients to then sort of shape uh, um, into a thing. And then you'll get back, you know, scripts that can be surprising in kind of the good way. Yeah. Um, but then there's enough time where if something for whatever reason sort of like went like a direction that's just not going to work with the rest of the season, there is time to kind of bring it back in. So it's like, it is very like beautiful mind or like, sliding doors um and there's all these like branches that go off and then you're sort of like choosing your way through them in like a really cool way that's also terrifying because a lot of times it's like what are we doing um but then it just kind of like comes together and did you have a formula that you like i mean often formulas are accidentally created over a period of long amount of time and repetition but um by the end of the season would you say that you had found a formula that would indicate to you like this episode we're going to do 80 percent you know, adult girls and 20% islands or islands, but you know what I mean? Um, are you going to do, is to this a 50, 50, like, would you approach each episode with any sense of rules or was each one kind of like, let's just tell the story that it's begging to be told. I mean, I think that we usually approached every episode thinking that the storylines would be approximately 50, 50. And I think sometimes it's a little more 60, 40, one way or the other, but that would end up happening kind of naturally. And then otherwise, just structurally in a very basic way, you know, we would break the two timelines separately at first. So we would break the wilderness storyline and then break the what's happening in the present day with the adults. And then we would kind of look at both of them and make sure that it felt like they were talking to each other enough. You know, it was always important to us that it, we never wanted it to be like so on the nose that like the theme here and the theme here were like just kind of completely overlapping, but we, we just wanted to make sure they were in dialogue, but get, they would just kind of kick the tires on that a little bit. And then really we would just, you know, especially if we knew we were gonna have um, a flashback within that was often just sort of the teaser. And so we kind of, that would usually get tacked onto the, the wilderness story. And then we would weave it together. Um, and we did break it in four acts because even though we don't have act breaks on Showtime, you know, we as came up in, you know, network television, and it feels really important to us to have those big moments. Like we learned from such an early stage in our career, how valuable it is to have like cliffhanger moments or big, mo you know, you, you just need to have what feels like big moments in a structural way. So we found that that worked for us pretty well to do, to break it in four acts. And then you really just kind of end up eyeballing approximately, you know, how many beats felt right. You start to get a sense, especially once we started production you're like okay now we know what we can and can't do and yeah. too many and and uh you know page count wise I think we started like really trying to toy with 56 57 58 page scripts and we were like we're cutting too much like nope can't fit that on the schedule so you know we ended up thinking okay between 50 and 54 55 is really our max and even 54 55 would start to get a little dicey um but otherwise we didn't end up having having any sort of story formula there was sort of like a structural way that we approached it but um i wish that we had more me too me too I, I sort of think about it more in terms of atomic weight you know i mean one of the things that the show that you guys created does so well is it asks you to suspend your left brain with great regularity and so in the writer's room julie we're, we're always looking as a group for those moments that seem completely truthful even though slightly illogical and if they seem truthful, we'll go with them because there's a broader emotional logic at work, you know? So like, we're always kind of looking for that footing. And, and that is ineffable. Like, you don't know what that is, but if you've got a room of really smart writers and like most of them think it's working, we usually trust that instinct and at least try to make it happen in the script. Yeah, and like, um, like, like I guess it's not like a structural uh, kind of mandate as much as maybe a, a, a uh, kind of an aspiration is that we would like to sort of have like a story at least in each uh, kind of episode that can maybe like uh, like be like a bit of uh, kind of the anchor that has a sort of like beginning a middle and end like a resolution of, like of something um like we don't uh, literally do uh, uh kind of story areas but like I still very much have that um in the back of my head um where it's like oh like if I can't sort of like express what this arc is in like a couple of sentences, then like I, like there's a very good chance I don't have an arc and like that that like can feel like a little uh, kind of meandery. Like I feel like, 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 I, like I guess like I would prefer that in streaming, but I think especially if you're gonna air 
kind of week to week, like having just like a, like have the episode, you know, like at least a little bit have a reason to exist like uh, on its own own, instead of just having it be like a chapter. Um, Like I think just uh, kind of aesthetically. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like uh, um, an invitation and then uh, to show up and then a reward for having shown up to the audience, you know, it's like, Hey, come on in. We're going to tell you a story. Yes. Like 90% of it is going to be serialized, but there's this one little, piece of it that like here's your reward for sticking around for this episode i, I always right. like that this, and a lot you know in streaming sort of everyone's looked at it as like an open invitation to just abandon episodic structure and storytelling entirely which i'm like hmm. you know there is a reason why after an hour you do want to feel like you've accomplished something mm-hmm. as, a, as a viewer like you've been through something that is a journey but um okay interesting so a, a couple of things that you all did I just really, you know, as a fellow story breaker, um, just appreciate it, right? Little like things that I appreciate it. One is the the necklace. The necklace. You see the necklace in the first scene. You then meet Jackie with the necklace. And you're like, well, she's dead, you know? And then at the very end of the, when it, I think it's the first episode, you you swap the football. You like hand over the necklace. And I just thought that was so clever because it told me as a, as a viewer, like, okay, all right, these writers know what the fuck they're doing. Like they actually, they know the kind of stuff you're picking up on and paying attention to, and they're going to have their fun with that. Um, and I'm curious, was that like a stroke of genius? Did you recognize that as a really great moment when you came up with it? Or was it just sort of like, oh, and then that happens? <laughs> it would be, and then it, it's funny because um, we, we were kind of proud of ourselves. We were like, oh, this will be clever. And the, you know, the, the necklace can move around and we can keep people guessing. And then, you know, because this development process took so long, um, Black Monday um, on Showtime came out and they did something extremely similar with a tie pin. And we were like, God damn it. <laughs> but I guess like, you know, the, the, our executives weren't particularly worried about it. And the shows are so incredibly different. Um, but yeah, we were just like, well, I guess we weren't the only ones who had that idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I'm glad that you appreciated it. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, no, because then, and then the the, the mind screw of it all, I won't say F words again. Um, um, I might probably, but is, is that then it, well, it was actually Jackie who died by the end of the season. Spoiler. I already said that and I realized it was a spoiler. So I'm so sorry to anyone who's on this Zoom who has not finished the season. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I just thought, again, as a storyteller, like you're telling a mystery, right? You've got little red herrings, you've got little reveals. Uh, I, I thought um, I thought that was very clever. I also really, um, oh my gosh, the... I thought you buried your gay. I thought you buried your gay. Two thirds of the way through the season or halfway through the season, I'm like, oh my God, they buried their gay. And then lo and behold, you did not. So was it the, we can't bury our gays? Was it like always just meant to sort of be a, um, a nice uh, bait, a bait and switch, a nice, you know, what, what was that all about? I mean, we even got our network executives with that one because we, <laughs> I remember, um, yeah, they they read that draft and they were like, no, not Van. And we're like, it's okay. Calm down. <laughs> um, you know, I think that it's, you know, we're very aware of that trope and, and we wanted to avoid it. And in a way, we thought that there was something entertaining about going the other way and having our unkillable gay, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, I actually thought, because I was like in my head, I'm like, there's no way, there's no way they would do that. I said, but maybe because there is such, you know, good queer representation on the show, maybe they can, because the whole point is if you, if you have good representation, the tropes go away, and then you have the freedom to tell stories however you want to tell them, so I thought, well, maybe that, and then, you know, and then you fooled me, so um, also. uh, Yeah, I mean, luckily, that's one of the cases in which the story was compelling before we even thought about the problem, do you know what I mean, like, we were going to do that all along, and then we realized by doing that, we were also avoiding the trope that Ashley speaks about. But like, it was the story. It was always going to be the story. And, and um, you know, I hope that the audience really goes on a ride with us and sees where it goes uh, in season two. 
yeah, it's again, well done. Well done, little twists and turns. God, there was something else that I really wanted to ask you about, about a beat in the season that has now, of course, completely escaped me. So I'm going to get back into my um, my scripted questions that I talked about. <laughs> to, um, uh, yeah, all right. So you opted to add supernatural flavoring. Did that come as a result of like needing additional tension, um, feeling like, oh, like we need more, we need a, a more hats on this hat to keep it feeling fresh. The audience, the genre audience is really gonna be hungry for this. Was it a, a, a sort of pressure from an outside source or was that just genuinely the, the part of the pitch from the beginning? I mean, I, it was, um... It was part of the pitch from the beginning. It's like, I mean, like, like I think that it's like, I don't know if there was um, an internal pressure to make it more kind of exciting. Uh, uh, um, although like everything we do is trying to make it more uh, kind of exciting and like, uh, like just, uh, uh, you know, like fun to watch. Um, yeah, I guess like, like, it was just like something that felt right. And the more that we kind of like elaborated on it, um, it had so much uh, uh, like, like uh, um, it allowed us to sort of track some things uh, uh, thematically. Um, uh, um, in like a way that like, just felt like really sort of like powerful. And like, I think it also helped us, um, although I don't know that this was like the intent uh, um, in the front, um, it could have been like uh, subconsciously, like I think it allowed us to like, heighten it like heighten the whole feel of the show just a bit where uh like uh, uh like uh, uh we could do things that were tremendously dark and have a lot of pathos without ever having to stay there so it's like in like a heightened world with this like you know supernatural question uh we'll call it because we would also like uh, kind of aspire to or like would uh, submit that the first season reads as maybe like uh, um, a supernatural question. Um, it like allowed us to sort of like veer um, into dark and funny and um, like it just like allowed us to go uh, kind of a lot of places because of the way it sort of just, just, just turns the world up a bit. Yeah, no, I, I, I thought it was interesting because it was more metaphysical supernatural than anything else, you know, but like again, mm -hmm. Jackie coming in from the cold and you think it's, I mean, come on guys, this is some good, this is some good storytelling stuff. Um, I mean, I, we do have time for some questions, which I also, you know, if anybody wants to put them in the chat, but in the meantime, I'm going to do a little bit like, you know, um, sort of quickie ask and answer, right? So, you know, it always happens. You start writing a season and you, character breaks out for you, character you fall in love with. So for each of you, who became, who became your, your like secret favorite? <laughs> We're not good at quick answers. You know right. what? While yeah. you think about it, I'm going to say this. Lottie, Lottie started as like, oh, the, who's this mysterious girl? And then, of course, the ending blew that wide open. Uh, like, was that intentional to give Lottie that twist from the beginning? Okay. All right. This is good to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was funny because we had to, because she doesn't play a big part in the pilot, um, we had to write a lot of additional Lottie sides because um, we knew how big of a, a role she was going to play. So that was a little tricky and also trying to convince someone, you know, like Courtney, who is so talented, like, okay, we know you have like five lines in the pilot, but this story is going to grow. Um, I will say mine, like, I, it's, I think it's because it's a combination of like watching a total pro just like chew up this part and also because it's so much fun to write, like Misty in general is, I also, yeah, every yeah. time I one of the quizzes I always get misty I think I just end <laughs> yeah no yeah yeah I mean uh, I, I mean uh, they're all great like uh, I definitely like have a soft spot for a uh, kind of misty I will say that when I took the who are you uh, uh, I'm in the yellow jackets <laughs> quiz I did get uh, a kind of lottie and felt like really good about that and was just like I'm not taking this quiz again like I got the answer I wanted <laughs> And Donald. You know, this may surprise everybody, but we had a hard time finding our Travis in season one. And uh, we weren't 100% sure 
that that relationship in the wilderness between Travis and Natalie was really going to work. Um, so obviously we had it in our minds to sort of write it in a very potent way. Like, but you know, by the time they get, and again, spoiler alert to anybody who hasn't seen the whole season, but like by the time they get to their little love nest in the bloodstained fuselage of the crashed plane, if there was no chemistry there and it wasn't going to work, that was going to suck. So like we were very lucky, I think, in um, alchemically, you know, winding up with those two actors to play that storyline because um, we took a risk on someone, um, you know, and Kevin came in and, you know, after looking at a lot of different actors for that role, he came in and, and we felt did a wonderful job for us. Yeah, they, that was a nice, I loved that love story. Just like watching that grow, watching how like normal teenage it was when he's like, I can't share right. my feelings because I'm a bro. Like, and she's like, well, I'm going to share my feelings by swearing at you and being a bitch because that's what we do when we're teenagers. We just communicate from like either total avoidance or total rage. Um, <laughs> speaking of though, speaking of, let's talk about Javi because my question is, did you guys not learn anything from Lost? Because Javi is your Walt. He's in puberty and he's going to grow. So is that why he's off in the woods undiscovered and we don't know where he is? Is he now going to be off the show until five year flashback, flash forward so he can let right. him grow up, you know, grow a foot and have his voice drop? I mean, we did not learn our lesson, not even a little bit. And um, I don't want to give any spoilers. Uh, but... <laughs> yeah, I think the answer is no. Yeah. We were like, yeah. <laughs> um, also about Lost, you don't have the benefit of Hawaii uh, and a year-long summer, uh, nor obviously do you want it because you're in the wilds, you're in the, you know, you're in the snow and all that. Um, but how the hell, like, are you going to have to shoot a whole season in the winter and outside in winter? Like, what are you going to do? I, I think we're about to find out because our plan is to start production at the end of the summer and it's the winter and I think we're going to have to get really creative. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fake snow does work. That's the good news, but you need a lot of it and it's expensive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think um, we're gonna, like, I think what we're going to do is um, like have approximately 400 meetings um, where we like uh, figure out how to do it from every angle and point of view. I suspect, I mean, the first time I ever wrote it's snowing in a script was when I was working on a show called the district and I just wrote it's snowing cut to 300 tons. I kid you not of ice on condors. Um, and I, like, I couldn't believe what like that one sentence did to the entire production to the point where transpo people and others were saying like, we're never doing this again. So I think we'll have to get very creative about how to do this in season two that doesn't involve 300 tons of ice. Well, preferably it doesn't involve shooting in the tundra, you know? <laughs> right. When we shot the pilot, we did shoot that. Um, the entire pilot was shot on locations. We didn't have any stages or sets. And um, so we shot- By the way, where were you? I went to ask. LA, which was like <coughs> great to be in. Yeah, we did a lot of palm tree removal in VFX. Um, we shot in Pasadena. We shot the, the high school is John Marshall up in Los Feliz. Shot up in the Valley a bunch. And um, and then for the wilderness stuff, the those little snippets, we shot up in Mammoth. And so it was like, so many meetings and so much panic. What if it doesn't snow? What if it doesn't snow? What if it doesn't snow? And then it was like, oh my God, it snowed too much. It snowed too much, you guys. It was like, <laughs> got like eight feet of snow in the two weeks before we were supposed to shoot. And um, it was wild. They had to put all these, um, th this rubber mat track matting. Cause if you stepped off it, you would go like up to your chest in the snow. And um, we had to take snow cats and snowmobiles to get to set. And two days of that like almost killed everybody. So not a great option moving forward. It looked amazing. Um, I think it was worth it for that, but. Did you shoot the whole season in LA? No, we were no, in no. I You went. were, okay. Oh, oh my God, okay. I was like, I um, have no idea. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that might like be of uh, uh, kind of interest to people is like, like uh, just to go back, you know, like, uh, we have uh, obviously started to think about and like uh, talk about how uh, 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 we will do this, you know, uh, crazy thing. But I will say a thing that we learned from you, Julie, and it, like a thing that I know that like Jonathan is like a big adherent to is like, you know, like the first draft, you know, should just be like, what is the best story? And then you can sort of pare back and adjust to the realities of like a uh, kind of production. So it's like, 
know that you will have to adjust it, but also like, like at first to pretend uh, within reason, you know, that you can do uh, kind of anything seems to be the best way to get the story right. Um, and then yeah. you can kind of like adjust it. I, I couldn't agree more and yet I've broken my own rule so horribly that I can't even enjoy breaking story anymore because oh, really? my, my producer brain is so loud that mm -hmm. I'm in my head saying, nope, can't do that, can't afford it, can't afford it. And I did one show recently where we just said, we're not gonna worry about money when we break story. We're just not gonna worry about it. And the stories broke like a dream and it mm -hmm. blew my mind because I had forgotten that like half of the problems of breaking a story are the burdens and pressures that I'm putting on myself 100%. and that we put on ourselves as producers. Uh, and not to say like, I mean, the problem is if you run free and you know do whatever you want, then, then you have to pay the piper on the other side and it creates so much more work for you on the B side, but it lets you have fun telling the story as opposed well, more, to- Moreover, I 100% I agree with you and I'm a huge proponent of that, but also you don't want to deprive yourself of any riches. If you can, if you can stop doing the meta thinking, like the metacognition, where you're thinking about thinking, and just think, and then tell a great story, you're going to wind up with some jewels in there. And then when line producers and other production people say this is ridiculous, and you look at the budget, something that you've created because you've given yourself the space to do it will remain, and it will be great. And you will never have put it there if you self-censored. Yeah, that's really, really great advice. Um, speaking of great advice, as we as we head to the end here, um, so the advice I always give people, and I'm giving you guys the lead up to it because you're gonna have to think of your own. Um, so I'm, I'm buying you some time. Um, it's something that I learned in my first writer's room, which was Kyle X Y, from Eric Tuckman, the lovely Eric Tuckman. Um, he said, "Every writer, in their own way, feels like a fraud." You know, like no matter what you do, no matter how good you get, successfully you get, you always feel like this is your last job and this is the one that um, everyone's going to discover that you don't know what the hell you're doing. And I thought at the time, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I, that, that seems so insecure, but like, okay, cut to, I'm now, you know, 20, 17 years later um, from that job. And that couldn't be more true because I still, every outline I hand in, every script I hand in, every show that I'm about to launch, I still feel that every time. And to the point where my friends are like, shut the fuck up. Like enough of your, oh, poor, I'm so insecure. I'm a fraud, bullshit. Like you're, you've done fine, you know? It actually annoys people now, but like the, the advice is real, which is like, it is okay to not believe in yourself. <laughs> that you think that other people are like looking at you like you don't know what you're doing. But the bottom line is if you're working and your words end up on the screen and people say your words, and nobody out in the ether is like, those are the worst words ever written. And by the way, they might actually, there might be one person who says that, but like your words are being said on television, right? You're doing something right. So carry on and find your strength in, in the process and, and in the joy of storytelling. So that's my advice. I'm not gonna put you all on the spot if you don't have something, but if you do, please jump in because I think it's always nice to pass on these little wisdoms. Well, I will say, I mean, I've been in the business, I guess, 20 years now. If I, is that true? No, 20, even, even longer, maybe 21, really. And uh, every single time I sit down to break a story or write a script, I feel like I'll, I won't be able to do it. And the only thing that you have in your quiver is this notion that you've done it before. And that's very helpful. But I, and I, I must submit, and I say this with respect to, to everyone here, you know, if you're the kind of writer who suddenly feels like you've cracked the code and you don't have any self-doubt, it's probably not somebody that I want to work with, to be perfectly honest, because that's not that's not a person who's constantly striving and sees writing as no ceiling. You know, like it can always get better. You can always make it more inhabited and more interesting. And I want to work with people like that. And then at a certain point, obviously, you have to shoot it. And that's a relief in some ways. But like Oscar Wilde said, right, a piece of writing is never done, it's just abandoned. Yes, it's a great quote. It's, it's so true. I mean, I think every time we start a new script, um, I will, the first thing I will do is take a couple hours and I will read 
a script that we've already written just to remind myself that we can do it. And then I'll, I'll take a look at, and you know, I don't read the whole thing from start to finish. I'll just read a little bit. I'm like, oh, okay. Like I, we were able to do this before. And then I'll read a, a script that I really like. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just take a look at like the sixth sense I think is actually a, a really, really beautifully structured piece of writing. And, and it just helps, it like kind of reminds you what it is, but yeah, it, I think you, you have to forgive yourself for the doubt. I mean, I, I would say for so much of production and even those first cuts, like I just had this, I, I knew that, you know, people that I really liked and respected Jonathan and Bart and all our other collaborators like felt good about what we were doing, but my God, that little voice in the back of your head, that's just like, what if this ends our careers? What if this is just embarrassingly bad? Like you just, and it will keep you up at night. Um, but the piece of advice I almost have now, especially for maybe more up and coming writers is that I always felt this intense anxiety and pressure because I thought you had to be great at everything. And I think you should aspire to be great or at least be getting better at everything. You know, Try to really push yourself if, if pitching in the room isn't your strong suit or if you're a great pitcher, but you're feeling a little weaker on the page, like push yourself, but know that like, it's very rare that people are great at everything on, on a staff. Like they're the pitching people, they're the writing people, they're the producing people. And, you know, generally you're hoping that everyone is at least competent in all of those things, but like find your strength too, and just know that that is very valuable and it may be one part and not another. And by the way, the same is true of the showrunner. It is mm -hmm. nearly impossible for a showrunner to be great at every little facet of the job because it, it's just working too many different parts of, of the personality and the brain. So figure out where your showrunner might be grateful for, um, you know, some uh, some help and and start filling in, start, you know, playing a role that they might actually really be happy to have you be good at. 100%. Great. Bart, any final um, words? Yeah, well, I mean, like, I guess if I would, like, it's like, I don't even know if this is like, good advice or not so like like I guess it's more maybe like a report on where I'm at and what I'm like uh, kind of working on um but like I guess it's really uh, kind of accepting that like um I'm gonna like probably forever have to like do this like my own way like because like I have this idea and it's like 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 and like I think it's actually other screenwriters who so many of them write that scene about the writer where they like sit down and they just like start typing and like they don't stop typing and they go from the beginning to the end and it's just like genius and it's like that is like I have like literally had I don't know like maybe like eight minutes of that ever <laughs> right and like that's cumulative where it's just like oh it's just like like it's just coming out of me um at, like and so like, I think like understanding that it's like, oh, like the process and the way that like I do this is allowed to like change and be a little weird maybe, or like have to like, and the other thing is that it's also the realization that I don't hate writing as much as I think I do. Um, it's that I hate being afraid for the entire time that I'm doing it. Like, oh it's not God. that I'm like, like totally freaking out, but there's like a low level of anxiety that creeps in and is so exhausting for every minute that I'm doing it. And it's that like, it's like, I'm trying to like learn how to deal with that better just to make like writing just a little, like a little easier. Um, I don't know if I'll ever like get there to where it's fun, but like, I have a feeling it could be fun if I could just not be so afraid the entire time. Well, you know, Bart, I 100% agree with you and being a little further along in my career, I wanted to be a different kind of writer for years. I want it to be that draft writer that you're describing. I want it to just like write the vomit draft and then go back and rewrite it and make it sparkly and sprinkle fairy dust all over it. I'm not that kind of writer. And like, eventually I looked in the proverbial mirror and I said, oh, I'm going to now accept just to alleviate a little bit of this anxiety and pressure that I am not that kind of writer. I'm going to look myself in the eye and be like, you're not that kind of writer. You probably never will be. In fact, I'm the kind of writer that takes every idea I've ever had like you want to buy a couch, you're going to look at every couch in the universe and you put it into this one thing and then you whittle and shape like a sculptor. 
you know, and that's the kind of writer I am. And you know what, that's just the kind of writer I've got to be. And eventually, if you can get to something that, you know, you think has a lot of merit and, and like is worth shooting, you've won. So as we wrap up, I, I, I am just discovering that I have to apologize to the audience because I was looking in the chat for questions and nobody was asking any. And I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to keep talking, not realizing there was an actual Q&A chat. So there were, in fact, actually in part 26 questions that were asked that we are actually not going to be able to answer. Um, so that's totally my bad. And I'm sorry about that. That's um, what everyone gets for putting me in charge. Um, see, like not everybody can do everything. Uh, but what I will say is like a common theme um, in, in a lot of the questions are things we did talk about, thank God. But also I think, um, you know, the, the big question is like, you just had a smash hit, like literally your first show together is a smash hit. That's amazing and fantastic. So now you're, you're approaching season two and um, in, in our final minute, um, how, how, how do you do it? <laughs> I guess I should have seen this coming, but like it, the fear is so much greater now. Yep. <laughs> we were we were talking with a friend um, who we were working on a feature project with after we shot the pilot. And um, I think we had just gotten the series order and I was kind of anxious about the whole thing. And he was like, I mean, no, we were already started. And he was like, it's okay. Cause now there's like 500 shows and there's like five shows people care about because they like them and five shows people care about because they hate them and everything else like has a little audience and no one else particularly cares. And like, I took so much comfort in that. And now I'm like, Oh no, people seem to have found a, like, I, and you know, I have no real grasp of how big of a hit this is. Like, you know, you, your life still feels pretty much the same and we don't have like the metrics or anything but um yeah I think you because the feeling is that now you have to like exceed the expectations you know you can't just do the same thing again you have to try to do it better and so we're gonna just try to do that and I think that the way we're approaching it is to just try to let ourselves be as as weird as we want to be this season um but I don't know what do you guys think I feel like I'm rambling now yeah <laughs> Um, I, you, you know, I mean, like, I, like, I mean, I think one is like, I have to kind of remind myself that like, um, I am like, uh, feeling the strain of it because it's like, I guess like I do this thing where it's like, I don't want to admit that I'm afraid. So I just sort of like think everybody in traffic is like out to get me. Like, like I just get into this like very like tense, like sort of like defended state where like, like it feels like the entire world is trying to take something from me. And it's like, oh, like just kind of remembering it, like this is how I react to like pressure and fear. And then I guess the other thing is like, just like always trying to get back to, you know, it's like, um, you know, like, like for me, and like, I guess I think for like a lot of people, it's like, I can't think my way to like a good story. Like I can't be like, oh, well, like this would be the thing that like, that like I should do because of this. It's like, like, like I kind of have to like feel it and be excited by it and sort of like trusting that that thing that is exciting to me um, and to us will be a uh, kind of exciting again. And then I guess like be prepared to live with the consequences uh, um, if it is not. Yeah, and to bring it full circle, I 100% I agree. And to bring it full circle, I think that's the beauty of having a triad. You know, I mean, if the three of us are kicking stuff around and even deeply in the trenches and it's tough, but if all three of us are saying there's something here that is living inside me and we wake up the next day and we're still into it, you know, that's all you can do. And with great respect to our audience who says, oh, you know, the story should go in this direction or that direction, really the direction it has to go in to be solid, cohesive, and, and holistically good is the direction that we want it to go in. And I don't say that out of ego. I say, we have to feel it or else we literally can't execute it, right? It's not going to be good. And so I think if we're kicking the tires on it among the three of us, and we all agree that this is something worth pursuing, you just have to have faith with a capital F and stay the course. And I will be rooting for Coach <laughs> Kruger. <laughs> our friends who um, um anecdotally ashley and bart picked 
Stephen, along with um, the producers for their first episode of the originals. Um, actually, was that yours or was that? It was. Uh, it was episode three, so it wasn't. That was ours. That was. Uh, it was yours. Yeah. People up in blue. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and then by five years later, he was a beloved series regular, and now he's with you all, and and so yep. good on him. But hey, everybody, thank you so much for those of you who joined us today. This was actually super fun. Um, Ashley, Bart, and Jonathan, thank you for your candid comments. Thank you for your transparency. Thank you for admitting your fears. Thank you for committing your um, and dedicating your next, all your creative energy into a great season two. And um, and I'm just telling you that Javi, it's you're you're you're, you're in a bad place there. <laughs> you're gonna have to figure that out. <laughs> So much for doing thank you julie yeah and, <laughs> thank um, you so much um you know even before taking the time to do this so I appreciate it and i'm so excited for all your upcoming projects too oh thank you yeah. i appreciate it you know yeah uh thanks so much for doing this and um like i mean like i think you were joking before but you should have a podcast like uh this was great hosting uh thank you so much by the way this is my dream this is my dream i always said i'd like if i i want to be on like a talk show i want to be like a host on the view so this is like the next best thing also you have like the best voice yeah <laughs> <laughs> well thank you um all right yeah so i don't know if we hang up or if the but oh and please if you have money um <laughs> any money five dollars a dollar the Writers Guild Foundation, who's hosting this event and hosts events like this all the time. I don't know how many of you have been to their library, but it is a really, truly an incredible resource for writers. I use it. It's been closed for two years because of COVID. They're on their, they're on their way back up. Um, but, you know, having been closed two years for COVID, I'm sure that uh, they could use any donations from guild members alone, um, and non-guild members because you don't have to be a guild member to go into the library. So... Um, which is full of books and scripts and everything you ever needed to know and read about making mil movies and making television. So head over to their websites, give them a search and give them some, some, some cash money if you can. And they didn't ask me to do that. That's me actually like hawking for them because I really believe in this foundation and, and everything that they're doing. So um, in fact, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to go donate myself.